Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. People regularly ask, how do you get so many people involved in what's going on at FaithBridge? The answer is always the same. That has always been our expectation, that if you're a part of FaithBridge, if you're a Faith Bridger, you're gonna use your gifts and you're gonna step into the action and you're gonna be part of what's going on. I remember when I had just gotten here, I had the vision, I had the theory of everybody doing something and nobody doing everything and the body of Christ coming together. I had the, the, the theory, I just didn't know how to get from here to there. And so I fell back on my own strengths and abilities and just kind of figured, you know, I'll just get it all done because when you're starting out, you, you kind of got to get it all done. And so it, it, until I hit my breaking point about two or three months in and just about threw in the towel and said, I can't do this. And it was in that moment I had a defining conversation with our, our core group. And I said, um, you know, picture this bag of landscaping stones and I'm carrying this bag of landscaping stones. I've carried it for this many months, but I can't carry it anymore. So I'm breaking the bag open and I'm handing each of you one of these stones. And from here on, all of us are gonna carry our individual stone. And if everybody will carry one stone, then the whole bag moves, but nobody's getting broken down because you're seeing yourself as this, as this team, as this family where everybody's uh, doing what God equipped them to do. And I think one of the things that has been so gratifying and fulfilling in the last couple of weeks with Harvey and the floods and all is just like an explosion. I have seen our people go into overdrive and right before my very eyes, I'm seeing the fruit of what we've practiced. And the last couple of weeks, it was, it was game time. It was final exam time. We had this opportunity and you wonder, how will your church respond? And it was beautiful. Now, the challenge is as the floodwaters of Harvey recede and the city begins to get rebuilt for us to remember that the floodwaters of hopelessness and despair and spiritual darkness and dismay and divorce and abuse and abandonment and trafficking and all these things, they are still happening all around us, which is why it's all the more important that we, the body of Christ, continue to shine as a beacon of light, spiritual light and, and hope into our community of spiritual darkness. What I really hope that people see is that this doesn't just happen in emergency times like Harvey or crises. This is happening week by week around here. It's happening as people carry their stones and they go down and they serve at Bridging for Tomorrow and they mentor some of the students or they help with the food. It's happening on the Klein campus, uh, whether people are uh, working in the children's ministry or holding babies or doing a, a, a small group for the teenagers or they're ushering or greeting or parking the cars and keeping everybody safe. And it's happening at the Woodlands campus every week in Colson Tuff when we're turning a school into a church and then we're dismantling it and turning it back into a school. And this is every week people are carrying their stones. And that's why we're here to be this community of light that's shining forth with hope and spiritual promise and opportunity so that people, when they see us, when they see Faith Bridgers, 
they're like, I've got to get to that place because I can tell something is happening there that is transformational. Well, amen. Good word from Pastor Ken, huh? Good morning, everyone. It's great to see all of you here today, whether you are in Center Court East, Center Court West, in the Woodlands, or if you're coming to us online. We're glad that you've chosen to worship at Faith Bridge today. We're continuing on in our sermon series that we're calling Better Than Perfect. It is a look at the life of King David of Israel. And today we're going to be looking at a story from David's life that is unlike any other story in the Bible about David. In fact, as I was preparing the message, it struck me as being so different from all of the other David stories that I found myself wondering, how did this thing get in there? And why is this story included in the biblical record? It's found in 2 Samuel chapter 9. If you want, go ahead and turn in your Bibles. 2 Samuel chapter 9. If you need a Bible, Raise your hands. The ushers are coming down the aisle. They will be glad to give you one, and that can be yours to keep. Please consider that a gift from Faith Bridge to you. 2 Samuel chapter 9, beginning with verse 1. David asked, Is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba. They summoned him to appear before David, and the king said to him, Are you Ziba? At your service, he replied. The king asked, Is there no one still alive from the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? Ziba answered the king, There is still a son of Jonathan. He is lame in both feet. Where is he? The king asked. Ziba answered, He is at the house of Machir, son of Amiel, in Lodibar. So King David had him brought from Lodibar, from the house of Machir, son of Amiel. When Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. David said, Mephibosheth, at your service, he replied. Don't be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather Saul, and you will always eat at my table. Mephibosheth bowed down and said, What is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? Then the king summoned Ziba, Saul's steward, and said to him, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him and bring in the crops so that your master's grandson may be provided for. And Mephibosheth, grandson of your master, will always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said to the king, Your servant will do whatever my lord the king commands his servant to do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son named Micah. And all the members of Ziba's household were servants of Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table, and he was lame in both feet. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the privilege of gathering in your house today. Our minds and hearts go out to those in Florida who cannot gather in houses of worship because they are experiencing what we did just a few weeks ago. We pray, O God, that you would protect, that you would draw near, that you would bring comfort and hope and peace. Thank you for the privilege we have of not only gathering here, but being able to lift up the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray now that as we turn our attention to your Word, your Holy Spirit would be present just as you promised to teach us, and to guide us into all truth. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So what is it that makes this particular story different from all of the other David stories? Well, for one thing, it gives us a very rare glimpse 
into the more peaceful, gentle side of David. Now, I emphasize rare because David was not exactly known to be a peaceful, gentle person. You look through the biographical material about David in the Bible, and what you find is a battle-hardened warrior, a man very accustomed to bloodshed and to violence. After all, we're told that when he was uh, but a lad, he managed to kill both a bear and a lion with his bare hands. He was the one who slew the giant Goliath and then took a sword and cut his head off. The Israelites sang a song about him. Saul has slain his thousands, but David has slain his tens of thousands. He was the premier military leader in Israel's history. They reached their zenith as a military power under David's rule. In fact, this particular chapter, chapter 9, is sandwiched in between two of David's most significant victories. In chapter 8, we read about his victory over the Philistines, and in chapter 10, his victory over the Ammonites and the Syrians. At one point in his life, David petitioned God for permission to build a temple, an everlasting temple where God could reside and the people of Israel could come and worship him. But God said, no, I'm not going to let you do that because your life has been marked by too much bloodshed. I will let your son build me a temple, but because of your violence, you will not be able to do this. So David is not exactly the most peaceful, gentle sort of person. Why then would this story be stuck in here? Well, perhaps it was so that we could have a more well-rounded view of who David was, understand that he was not just a warrior, but that there was a soft side to him as well. That's a possibility, but I don't think that's the main reason why the story is in here. No, I, I think the primary reason this story is included is because God wants to teach us something. He wants to teach us something about who he is, about who we are, and about the relationship that he desires to have with each one of us. The key to understanding this particular chapter is in understanding a word that is found three different times in the chapter. You may have noticed in verses 1, 2, and 7, the word kindness. The NIV translates from the Hebrew word hesed, kindness. And that's a pretty good translation as far as it goes, but it doesn't really give us the full force of what hasted meant. It wasn't just sort of your run-of-the-mill kindness where you're simply nice to other people. No, hasted carried much more weight. For one thing, to demonstrate hasted was to extend to someone who was not deserving of kindness your kindness. It's not that they had necessarily done anything evil or wrong or bad, but at any rate, they didn't necessarily deserve your kindness, but hasted you would extend it to them anyway. Secondly, and more importantly, hasted was all about extending kindness to those who would never ever have the ability to pay it back. In spite of their inability to do so, perhaps even their unwillingness to do so, Hesed extends kindness. It's what David calls God's kindness. And Hesed is what David extends to Mephibosheth. And certainly, if anybody needed Hesed, it was Mephibosheth. He had a difficult life from the get-go. I mean, for starters, his father gave him that ridiculous name, it's almost impossible to pronounce. But beyond that, when he was just an infant, his nanny actually dropped him and injured his feet to the point that he was crippled for the rest of his life. But worst of all, he had the terrible misfortune of being one of the last living descendants of King Saul, David's predecessor. Now, why is that such a problem? Well, you probably know that King Saul and King David weren't on the best of terms in their relationship. In fact, King Saul spent a great deal of his rule 
resources, men, effort, all sorts of things, trying to have David killed. And so when Saul was defeated by the Philistines and when his rule came to an end and David went to the throne, Mephibosheth was in trouble. Why? Because in that day and time, the custom of that culture was when a new king came to the throne, the first order of business was to eradicate every single family member of the previous king. This was the new king's attempt to consolidate power, to make sure that there would never be anybody who could rise up one day and lay claim to the throne. And so you have to think that when the messenger arrived at Makir's house, asking for Mephibosheth, saying that he was summoned to the palace, Mephibosheth's heart sunk. He knew what was coming. I would have to think that probably for any number of years, he had been laying low, hoping against hope that David would never discover that there was a descendant of Saul still out there. But that fateful day came when he was summoned to the palace and he knew the inevitable was going to happen. That's why when he comes before King David, he falls on his face and he identifies himself as nothing but a dead dog. He knows in fact that's what he is. So can you imagine, can you just imagine the confusion, the, the, the sense of shock he must have felt as he's lying there before King David, fearful for his life, and David suddenly says, Mephibosheth, you don't have to be afraid. I'm not going to kill you. That's not why I brought you here. In fact, not only am I not going to kill you, I, I'm going to restore to you all of the land of your grandfather. And even better than that, I'm going to invite you to my table at every meal. You will have a place of honor at my table. In essence, David was adopting him as his own son. You have to think Mephibosheth was a bit skeptical, wondering, could this possibly be true? Because it certainly wasn't the order of the day. Just by virtue of his lineage, he was an enemy. And no one would have batted an eye if David had had him executed on the spot. But David does not do that. He extends to him, hey, Sid. And to me, one of the most beautiful aspects of this story is that David was under no compulsion whatsoever to do so. He was the king, the unquestioned authority. He was the ruler. He could have done whatever he wanted to. He could have chosen just to ignore Mephibosheth altogether. He could have had him killed, and nobody would have cared. But instead, David extended to him God's kindness. And Mephibosheth's life was never the same. So why is this story in here? This unusual story of King David's life. It's because God wants to teach us something about who he is, about who we are, and about the kind of relationship that he wants to have with us. You see, Mephibosheth is you and me. And every person who has ever lived, every single one of us have become the enemies of God. Now, perhaps you say to yourself, I don't really recall a day that I decided to do that. I don't remember conscious rebellion, but Scripture is clear that all of us have walked away from God and have chosen to move from the kingdom of light into the kingdom of darkness, becoming His enemy. You see, when God first created humanity, he did so with the express purpose of having fellowship with humanity, imparting life, eternal life to Adam and Eve and enjoying them and all of their descendants forever and ever and ever. But there was just one stipulation, a reasonable one at that. As the source of life, God said, you've got to stay connected to me. Life is not found anywhere else. Only me, therefore, stay with me, obey me, be my child, and you will live. But in the day that you choose to step away from me, in the day that you look for life anywhere else, you will surely die. And even though it was made crystal clear, and even though it had all been good, Adam and Eve 
in their arrogance and in their sinfulness, chose to be self-sufficient. And they stepped away and basically said, you know what, I think we'll try things on our own for a while. And sure enough, what God said came to pass. They died. And every one of their descendants down to the present has done the same thing. We have all sinned. We have all separated ourselves from the source of life and therefore put ourselves under a penalty of death. And God would have been well within his rights to let us suffer that penalty, just as David was well within his rights to have executed Mephibosheth, so God could justly let us die. But in the most amazing, beautiful, pure, loving act of hatred that the world has ever known, God sent his son Jesus to rescue us from ourselves, to rescue us from death. Because Jesus came to earth and lived a life that we could never live and willingly, freely offered himself as a sacrifice, taking the penalty, the punishment that we deserved upon himself. When he hung upon the cross, he paid the price we could not pay. And when he was raised from the dead and had conquered death, he opened the door once again for us to go back to the palace for us to go back to the king and to be welcomed into the palace and to be given a seat of honor and to be recognized as a child of God. That's why this story is in there. It is a perfect picture, a better than perfect picture of the gospel. Even back in David's time, the Bible is constantly pointing toward Jesus and the gospel message of Jesus. This story is in there to remind us that we are in debt to God for his hasted. We certainly didn't deserve it. We'll never be able to pay him back, and yet he freely gives it to us. I have to think, though, there's one other reason this story is included, not only to give us a picture of the gospel, but also to give us an example of how we should live. You see, as the recipients of Hasid, we should be the very first to give away Hasid to a broken, dying, and hurting world. We serve other people because God first served us. We love other people because God first loved us. The mark of the fact that we are recipients of hatred is our willingness to give it away. God's love always comes to us on its way to somebody else. And part of the privilege of sitting at the table, of being a child of God, is the ability to go back out and to demonstrate that same hatred to others. Not only because they have needs, but because they need to hear the message of the gospel. And sometimes the best way to hear is to receive, to be served by someone who is modeling the gospel. And I have to tell you, over the last two weeks, it has been one of the greatest thrills of my ministry to see hundreds of faith bridgers step up and demonstrate hatred to thousands of strangers people who haven't necessarily done anything to deserve our kindness other than being desperately in need, people that we will never, ever see again in some instances, and yet there's no thought to being paid back. That's not what it's all about. That's not what the gospel is all about. It's all about showing the love of Christ to a world that is broken and hurting. And as Pastor Ken said so eloquently in the video, serving is what we are all about. That's why we are here. Faithbridge doesn't have worship for Faithbridge. Faithbridge doesn't take up offerings for Faithbridge. Faithbridge doesn't have children's ministries and student ministries and adult ministries for those individuals. No, we are here for those who are not here. We are here for those who have not yet heard, who have not yet received the message and the gift of Hasid. And that is what God is calling each and every one of us to do. And hasted comes in all kinds of different forms. It's an act of hasted to stand at the door on a Sunday morning and give someone a smile and a handshake. 
or to work at a hospitality table and offer a donut and a cup of coffee or to be an usher and help people get seated or to serve children our children with disabilities, our student ministry, to go outside the walls of the church, to bless the victims of Harvey today and in the days to come, to go and demonstrate acts of hatred to those who are in Florida. I'm sure we'll be doing that one day. And to go to the uttermost parts of the world, giving away what we have received. This story is in here because God wants us to understand the significance of the gospel. And this story is in here because God wants us to take that gospel to a hurting world, not only with our mouths, but with our hands as we serve other people. I mentioned at the beginning of the message, this is uh, the most different message uh, story about King David that we find in the Bible. And in that same spirit, I I want us to end today's service in a way uh, differently than perhaps we have ever done before. So I'm going to ask for your help in ending today's service. And the uh, first thing that I would like for you to do is if you have your phone with you, take it out and show it to me. You You don't have to throw it at me, just let me see that you have have your phone. Awesome. If you don't have your phone with you, if perchance you forgot it or you just don't even have one, I'd like for you to raise your hand, not so that we can phone shame you, (laughs) but because the ushers are coming down the aisle with pieces of paper. And just as we hand out Bibles, if, if, if you don't have a phone with you, then please take one of these pieces of paper. And together, we are going to discover the many opportunities for Hasid right here at Faith Bridge Church. And we'll do it this way. If you happen to have the Faith Bridge app on your phone, I'd like for you to go ahead and open that app. If you don't have it on your phone, then text FBSERVE, one word, to the number 797979, and you should be receiving a link momentarily. And then the rest of us, piece of paper, hold on, we're going to get there. So if you have opened up the app, and in the last service, our Wi-Fi was running a little slow, uh, but hopefully it's, it's running now. If you have opened up the app, you'll find the opening page, and at the top of the page is uh, a little link called Start Here. Open that up. Start Here. And that will take you to a page where you will see a little box, Ministry Expo Sign Up. Tap on that. And then that will take you to a choice between the Klein Campus or the Woodlands Campus. If you're here in Center Court, East or West, of course, tap the Klein campus. If you're up in the Woodlands, tap the Woodlands campus. And then you'll see a place where you can enter some basic information that we need. Your name, email, phone number, how we can get in touch with you. And also, a wide variety of opportunities to serve. And I'd like for you to look these over, whether it's on your phone or on a piece of paper, and prayerfully consider two or three that you might be interested in. Notice we're not asking for a commitment. You're not signing up here. You're simply indicating to us, yes, I would like to demonstrate Hesed in this area. It may be here on a Sunday morning. It may be outside the walls. On your piece of paper, you're going to Check off two or three, and as you leave, the ushers will have baskets in the back where you can place those pieces of paper.
And then once you've had a chance to look that over and check off two or three as of interest, hit submit. And what that does is let those of us in leadership know who would like to serve where. And we will be getting in touch with you very soon to give you information. As you leave today, let me encourage you to also make your way to the uh, Center Court East Atrium. If you came in that way, you saw all kinds of tables with various serve opportunities. You can get information even before you leave. Those of you in Center Court West, come on over to the East Atrium. Those of you in the Woodlands, make your way out into the lobby. What we're trying to do is um, make serving as simple and as accessible as we possibly can. Over the years of my ministry, I've noticed uh, an unusual quirk in some Christians. Some Christians believe that the serving that counts is really the spiritual stuff, you know, the preacher, the worship leader, the people who aren't afraid to pray out loud, small group... That's not the way God looks at it. God is pleased with any act of kindness we do on His behalf, whether it's some of the things that happen here on a Sunday morning or some of the things that happen outside of the walls. They are all of equal value in God's eyes, and they all have the potential to touch and change a life. In just a moment, we're going to pray, and following the prayer, we will be concluding the service Please make your way out into the atrium, the east atrium, and in the woodlands into the lobby where you can learn more about these. This is a a sacred moment, and so I would like to consecrate it with a prayer. And I'm going to ask you, if you would, just hold your phone in front of you, hold your piece of paper in front of you, and I want to pray over these expressions of interest. Pray with me. Father, just as David didn't have to go looking for Mephibosheth and didn't have to extend to him life, you didn't have to come looking for us. And you certainly did not have to extend the gift of life to us. And yet in your goodness and in your mercy and in your grace, you did just that. And our lives have never been the same. We join our hearts to pray right now, Father, that that same spirit of hasted, of unmerited favor, of kindness that could never be repaid, that that would fill our hearts. And that the desire to serve others would be a reflection of our gratitude and our love for you. Thank you for all of the ministries that Faithbridge does. Thank you that we're a part of a church that even cares about these things, that we're not ingrown, and that we don't exist for ourselves, but we exist for those who are not here, and especially for those who are hurting. I'm asking you, Lord, to come and bless this moment, and I pray that on this day, there would be a greater response to the call to serve than we've ever known, and that more lives would be touched and changed than we've ever known. And above all, may the name of your son, Jesus Christ, be lifted up and glorified. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen and amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hi, and welcome to Postscript. I'm Lou Ann Riley, Grow Group and Discipleship Director, and I'm here with Pastor Dan, who just brought part three of our series on David. And this one we talked about better than kind. Mm -hmm. Welcome, Dan. Thank you. Uh, So we look today at this moment of intentional 
grace and kindness that right. David exhibited. Now, so tell me, when we left off last week with uh, Pastor Ken, we were in quite a famous story sure. of uh, Goliath and him facing the giants. And so this week, we're, we're quite a bit further into David's yeah. life. Can you just kind of tell me how we got here? Sure. Yeah, we have skipped ahead. Uh, but the good news is we will be going back mm -hmm. to pick those up. Uh, part of our reason for going ahead was purely practical. Uh, the story of Mephibosheth lends itself to serving, mm -hmm. obviously, emphasis of the sermon. Uh, but there's a great deal that happens uh, between Goliath and Mephibosheth, uh, the rise and fall of Saul's throne, uh, the death of Saul and his son, Mephib Mephibosheth's father, Jonathan, uh, lot, lots and lots of things, some of which we'll be getting back to in weeks to come. Okay, and so a question did come in around um, around Jonathan, where the scripture says, uh, for Jonathan's sake. Can you yeah. kind of fill us in on that? Yes, I can. So David and Saul's son, Jonathan, were the best of friends. Mm -hmm. And... Um, the scripture, I think, even describes them as, you know, being closer than brothers. Jonathan could see the handwriting on the wall. He knew that his father's throne and rule was coming to an end mm -hmm. and probably suspected that their lives were going to come to an end as well. And like any dad uh, would be concerned for their children, he was looking out for his children's welfare. He also was privy to the fact that God had anointed David to be the next king. And so the most logical thing to do would be to go to the next king who just happened to be his best friend and say, hey, would you please look after my kids uh, mm -hmm. when I'm gone? And uh, David vowed that he would. Mm -hmm. And so this, in part, was fulfillment of a vow to Jonathan. So he's keeping his promise yes. that he made to his friend yes. in this moment of kindness. Um, I love how we talked about the parallels mm -hmm. uh, that we see where, it's, where we are. Uh, loved by God this way and so undeserving. And so what a great message today to point us to serving one another and demonstrating kindness in the Thanks. way that David did. So thank you for that. Yeah. And thank you for joining us here for Postscript. We'll see you back here next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.